thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, a big part of the debate about fracking has certainly related to public health. So that means groups of people. But uh, in fact, we need to consider what happens to individuals, whether they're in the workplace fracking or whether they're in the community. And then we know that in Scotland, uh, in Wales, in Northern Ireland and in Ireland, uh, fracking at the moment shouldn't be going ahead. There are various forms of, of bans there, but it's still happening in England and it's still happening elsewhere. So what I want to do is have a look at uh, how the position has arisen whereby fracking has been accepted in some places and not others and to what extent it presents a significant individual, national and possibly a global threat to public health. To do that, um, I want to link it to not just debates about the science and the technology, but also the policy. If you hear some industry views, at one level they say, well, we've got the technology under control, we know what we're doing, we understand what sort of exposures can occur, we understand the routes that people may be exposed by, we understand the effects. And they also say, well, it's very well regulated, and our practice as an industry is very good, so don't worry. At one level, that's a simple solution. At another level, they will say, well, of course, technology always goes wrong. There will be failures of machinery. There will be exposures. But the key thing is they're not going to be significant ones, and they're not going to threaten either the workers' health in the industry or communities. That's, that's the argument. So what you've got in front of you there is something that CEPR, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, produced, which gives you an idea about shale gas generally and also coal bed methane. I'll mainly talk about fracking. Um, so we're talking about uh, fracking shale rock with high pressure water, injecting also sand and various fluids and other agents, and then using propants to make sure that you can get the hydrocarbons out. So that's how the process works. And I think CEPA are quite nice about this here. So they're saying this is where pollution can occur. And if you see, there could be things going up in the air, so there could be air pollution. There could be soil pollution, about which very little is known, even in the US. And there could be water pollution as you, you drill down. And the argument goes, we drill down, uh, various liquid goes out, things come up, and everything's under control. And here, you don't see the whole life cycle analysis of fracking. You see lorries going outside uh, the fracking zone. You don't see things coming in. And if we want to assess the public health impacts of fracking, we need to look at all the materials, all of the machinery and so on that comes in, and then we need to track it through till its disposal. Significantly, we can see economic assessments. There are economic life cycle analyses of fracking, but we don't have public health ones. But what is also significant is that the Scottish Government carried out a big exercise that people are very familiar with and decided we didn't know enough about the health effects to allow fracking to go ahead. But they also brought in economic arguments and other arguments. And I think in that sense, a lot of countries might benefit from using the public health strategy. Okay, so the assumption has been that risk assessment and risk management of shale gas has been fine. And one of the arguments from certain literary peers down in Westminster has been, well, we use coal, uh, we developed steel in the past, we've used wood, um, no problem there with those sorts of energy sources. Well, of course, nobody knew about what the effects might be um, of those particular developments. And it may well have been that even if we did know, uh, indeed, if we had known, we'd probably have gone ahead. But we know far more now about what the impacts of some of the substances and some of the processes will be. Um, and indeed, there was evidence at the time about big problems uh, with some of these materials. And the argument goes, well, we must have shale gas for energy. But of course, there's a lot of evidence showing that, in fact, why we're getting a lot of shale gas is to develop plastics. And that presents another set of, of public health assessments that I won't go into. Now, this picture, you might think, is the Findhorn community going down uh, to Inverness for a Friday night out. Um, 
but it isn't. <laughs> it's actually shale oil miners, shale oil miners uh, in West Calder in 1935. And the argument there was, well, it's not a particularly hazardous industry. The reason they're wearing capes, by the way, is because of water down in the mine, not necessarily because of any exposures. In fact, there were lots of exposures, but the biggest problem came for the process workers of shale oil, the paraffin workers, who were exposed to very high levels um, of a range of chemicals that caused uh, very serious cancers. Um, and if you're asked about, well, you know, we get on top of the problems very quickly, in the 1870s they were diagnosing these diseases. And it was 50 years on and they were still diagnosing these diseases. So you could say, well, we're much, much better now. We're much more sophisticated in what we do, and you won't get these sorts of problems. But in fact, there are a lot of vicious circles operating there. Uh, one is, you don't look, you don't find, so there's not a problem. And quite often, people don't want you to look, because if you find a problem, it's either going to be expensive or it'll delay the technology, and there'll be all sorts of issues. That's, that's one sort of vicious circle. Um, and I think it still applies in some areas, as I'll explain in a, a few minutes. The other one is you don't have the capacity to look. You don't have the, the monitoring equipment and so on. You can't work out what the effects of shale gas would be, both in a community uh, and beyond. Um, and then there are various versions of that as well. Uh, that as you go along, well, you do have the technology, you can monitor, but you can't make sense of it, or you monitor it and you don't release the results uh, because this may be problematic. Um, so these vicious circles certainly have been uh, running around for quite a while, and they're basically uh, linked in with this old adage about absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence that it allows, if you don't look, for people to say, well, there isn't a problem, and that's basically because you've not found it, uh, because you've not looked and you haven't found it. It doesn't mean that there isn't a problem. So an illustration of this just working its way through, thinking about fracking. Uh, benzene may occur naturally uh, in terms of uh, the geology and so on, and it may also be part of the fracking process. So the industry said, well, this is a well-established substance. You don't have to worry. There'll be no exposures. Uh, but in fact, in the 1980s and indeed in the 1970s, they were saying you actually should have tight standards of these. And the standard they were suggesting in <coughs> was 10 parts per million. Sorry. Um, <coughs> And the government regulators in the UK said, well, you know, we're quite happy with running with some of these standards. Uh, now, we're down to 0.1 part per million. Um, and it's viewed as highly problematic for a range of reasons. And if you look beyond the workplace, that's the workplace standard, now we see that risk assessments have identified uh, a difficulty about working back. So high doses means big problems, low doses don't. That has collapsed in toxicology. So there are real issues about very low dose, dose exposures. And there may be particularly vulnerable groups. Um, so they found that, in fact, benzene goes across the um, human placenta uh, and through milk. So it could be a problem, in fact, to, to, to an infant. And there are even issues, um, in fact, about cross-generational effects of benzene. So we started off being very confident, you know, we can control it. And now all of a sudden, we're saying that very low levels uh, could be highly problematic, both for communities and for workers. So this is where I think we should think of new approaches and new tools. A lot is made about the energy mix. You know, you've got to have the right range of things. But in fact, we should be looking at what chemical mixtures there are and to what extent uh, they may affect people. Uh, and there's two things that really we ought to be building in now to our risk assessments. One is the exposome. And the exposome is estimating the total exposures that might occur prenatal and postnatal. And there could be critical points where the effects will be very serious. So they could be very short, for instance, uh, in, in, in the pregnancy cycle, and they could be very short in terms of children. But as you go, grow older, you may still be getting lots and lots of exposures. So bear in mind the exposome. 
And also bear in mind the point about cumulative health impact assessments, which means that, in fact, you should consider the chemicals in the industry, uh, you should consider deprivation, you, could, you should consider a, a whole range of things, which is complicated and challenging. But if we don't make those assessments, we're not really going to be able to work out what the impacts of various processes might be. Of course, the argument about shale gas is that we already know uh, a fair amount about it, although relatively recently. So this is a, a, a picture of the literature that's grown on the subject. And in science, you're always looking at direction of travel. And the direction of travel has generally been that the fracking process uh, and the exposures of populations and different communities um, is presenting real risks. We know there are hazards, we know there are risks. And importantly, we may, we may be aware that there are unknown hazards there. So data gaps can be as important in public health uh, as the data knowledge. A few quick examples of how this operates. Um, there's a great deal of attention being paid to water. And people have said, well, if you look at the US, there isn't water pollution um, and there aren't problems. But in fact, if you look at what American researchers are saying, they're saying that it's very difficult in some instances to identify data on, on, on fracking processes. So how do you assess the risk? It's a leap in the dark. And what's intriguing about the US Environment Protection Agency picture there is they're actually showing things going into the workplace as well as things going out. That needs to be part of the total assessment. You know, exposure to diesel, to exposure to diesel transport problems and so on. Um, and what's often missing from these pictures is not just the chemical insults, but also issues about mental health and well-being. And what's very well documented now is communities threatened with fracking, not necessarily where fracking has occurred, um, have experienced significant public health problems uh, because of anxiety and so on. And that should be factored in. That's part of the consideration. We're told that regulation and inspection and industry practice will be good. Well, we've just seen a recent report coming out of the European Union, which was looking at regulatory practices and they found that there were real worries about whether we had the capacity to treat wastewater, uh, where, whether the various sites were appropriate, and whether or not uh, the variety of European governments uh, would actually uh, exercise uh, uh, appropriate control of the process. I won't get into Brexit, but there's clearly one school of thought that's saying, let, let everything rip and let's deregulate. And another school of thought, also with Brexiteers, who's saying we must maintain regulatory standards. But there's a worry there. Um, and, of course, you have to think nationally. You have to think globally. Uh, we've also seen some other reports that have looked at problems uh, with possible contamination from other activities. Again, I won't go into detail there, but it's saying it's a significant difficulty. And in the US, where they're meant to have everything cracked, they've done all the research, they still can't answer these problems. Nor do I want to go into detail on the literature, but there is a lot of literature there. What we know are that there are significant neurological associations with fracking. We also know that, uh, in fact, there are problems linked to reproduction from a number of studies. We also know that general health with regard to coal bed methane has been affected in terms of, uh, of uh, Australian studies. There are routes that have looked at skin contamination for workers. There are routes that have looked at benzene exposure for communities with significantly high levels in areas where fracking goes on. Um, and there are also reports now about neurodevelopmental problems based on a review of the literature about the chemicals that are used uh, in, uh, in the industry. And bear in mind, we are talking in some instances with endocrine disruptors that could be used in fracking, not of parts per million, not of parts per billion, but parts per trillion. So this argument that, oh, the doses, the exposures are very low, is irrelevant. What doses affect you? Very low doses could affect you. Um, here's a study on childhood leukaemia. Uh, 
uh, where they looked at over 100, uh, uh, 140 chemicals um, and looked at whether there were links or not uh, with, with leukaemia from air exposure and water exposure. And lo and behold, they found there was a lack of data on a whole set of these chemicals, so we don't know what the effect could be. But there was a lot of data indicating significant problems. So we should be very aware of that. I mentioned at the beginning the global issue and the national issue. So even if fracking doesn't go on in Scotland, um, if it's going on elsewhere, what are the implications? Well, you know, we know it may not be the worst contributor, but it's certainly a significant contributor to problems in terms of, of climate change. And that will mean not only more zoonotic diseases, uh, it will mean not only rises in, in, in sea levels, uh, but it will also have these other impacts on public health. Um, so if, if there are problems in terms of access to water, access to food, uh, in fact, it may be a factor in contributing to significant global conflicts. And we shouldn't forget that. So we need to join the dots up. Uh, we can't deal with things um, separately. You know, uh, we are in the Anthropocene uh, age where uh, we need to check what's going on. So is it a picture of gloom and despondency? Uh, well, I don't think it is. Certainly not in the Scottish setting where there were concerns about environmental justice. Um, there have been concerns about whether or not there's a social licence uh, to frack. And I think the argument now is, for a lot of people, well, we have sufficient evidence from the science. We have sufficient questions about the problems with the industry performing as it should, problems with planning creep and, and breaches uh, of planning, problems with regulators being able to check on what's going on, um, to lead us to a, a very different approach. And I don't think there's anything new to say if you look at what the World Health Organization was talking about 25 years ago, that's still highly relevant. Um, if we could bring some of those principles back in um, and if people were aware um, that they should expect certain things uh, in terms of information about what goes on and in terms of risks and openness about the gaps with regard to risk assessments, things would be better. So here you'll see every individual in that charter is entitled to information and consultation on the state of the environment and involvement in plans and decisions. Well, what we've seen in England is local communities being consulted and then basically they've been totally ignored. What we've seen in the US is the same thing. Um, and the mechanisms that exist for consulting communities about public health and other problems have been very poor. In health impact assessments done in Scotland, uh, often they've just spoken to a couple of focus groups and said, well, this is telling us you know, how communities feel, how they understand the hazards. The, uh, <clears throat> the other principles there relate to public policy. Uh, and again, it's almost saying, how do we prioritise what we do in the world? And the health of the individual in the WHO Charter, um, it needs to be uh, paramount as far as they're concerned, and particularly vulnerable groups. So that means pregnant women, you know, it means the very young, uh, and I'm paying increasing attention to this one myself, it means the older person uh, and people who, who are ill. There are a whole set of people who may be adversely affected when possibly other parts of the population um, won't be. Um, so that needs to be built in more strongly, particularly if we're talking about extremely low-level exposures. The next point that the Charter made was new technologies should be introduced with prudence. This is the precautionary principle coming in. Um, and appropriate prior assessment. And in Scotland, uh, in, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, to some extent in Wales, uh, in New York, uh, in France, in parts of Germany, they've decided that it is prudent not to go ahead uh, with the technology on the basis of the evidence that we've got. The health of the individual and communities should take precedence, clear precedence, over economy and trade considerations. Well, I, I'm a pragmatist. I'd settle for it being the health of individuals being treated equally with trade and the economy, but it isn't. Again, out with Scotland, I think, uh, those sorts of priorities are pushed right down.
and there are other drivers. And of course, bear in mind that what happens with the development of, of, of fracking uh, is that the costs, the adverse costs, don't disappear. They put on communities. We pay for the cost of people becoming ill, becoming stressed and so on, uh, very often not, not the industry. Um, and the final point is that with regard to uh, what's the best approach, then we're talking about low-impact technology and products. Um, so we know in Scotland, you know, we can look at wind, wave power, um, uh, we can look at tidal power, um, we can look uh, in, in, in other countries at solar energy and so on. And we have risk assessments, we have public assessment, public health assessments of those activities, and they're much better than fracking. Um, so I think the line has always been uh, from a number of cautious scientists, if in doubt, don't. And I think the evidence is there that we shouldn't for individuals, for nations, and globally. Thank you.